Hi, I'm Nancy Zeman, and it's time for Sewing with Nancy. Today I start a new three-part series entitled Fitting Finesse. Working with a basic or classic style pattern and making it custom fit just for you. There are basic tools to work with, very simple tools. We're going to work with tape measure, pins, patterns, some paper, and some marking pens. That's all we need to make this fitting technique work well. Fitting isn't my favorite part of sewing, but it's a very essential part. And that's what's coming up next on Sewing with Nancy. Sewing with Nancy TV's How to Sewing program with Nancy Zeman is brought to you by FOP, the largest European manufacturer of sewing machines. Look for FOP's line of creative sewing machines and hobby lock sergers. You'll do your best sewing on a FOP. By Ginger, a tradition of quality in scissors and shears for home, classroom, and industry. Ginger scissors and shears are the choice of professionals. And by Nancy's Notions Catalog, the catalog developed by Nancy Zeman, featuring specialty sewing, quilting, and serging books, notions, and supplies. I'd like to start our program on fitting finesse by getting the right pattern size. You know, sometimes this is the most difficult part. Traditionally, we've been taught to measure the bust line and buy the pattern according to the bust line measurement. This works out great if we have a proportion figure, but unfortunately, many of us have maybe a broader back or a fuller figure, and if buying the pattern according to the bust line measurement, you may get what I call gaposis. It gaps around the neckline. Maybe the shoulder is a little bit too long, and the armhole's too deep. Fits great around the bust line, but the other areas have a problem. To eliminate that problem, I prefer to have you purchase a pattern so it fits the shoulders first. And then we can fit the ins and outs as we go along. Working to get the pattern to fit the shoulders requires a kind of a different type of measurement. It's called the front width measurement. It's measured across the front of the figure, above the crease in the arm, across the front chest to the other crease. This illustration shows where the front width measurement is taken. Ask a sewing buddy to help you measure above one crease, across the front width to the other crease. And then measure to the closest half of an inch. Now if you're saying, Nancy, this is a fine measurement, but where do I find that on the back of the pattern envelope? Unfortunately, you're not going to. So we have a chart that will give you the guideline. Here's the guideline. Size 14 happens to be 14 inches. It's a great correlation. Size 14 is 14 inches, and it changes a half of an inch per size. So if you're 13 and a half inches, that happens to be a 12. 13 inches is a 10, and 12 and a half would be an 8. In the opposite direction, 14 and a half inches would be a size 16, 15 inches and 18, and so forth. That chart has given you now the basis for working with your pattern size. You may find that you'll be using a smaller size than you've had in the past. Now if you're thinking, what if I'm a junior size or a half size? We can use that same type of chart. For example, junior sizes are many times purchased size 11, 12 together, or 13, 14. If you would measure for a size 12, it's like a size 11, and you can see this correlated on the chart. If you measure for a size 14, it would be like a 13, 14 together, by a junior size 13. In the opposite direction for half sizes, simply by the corresponding half size, rather than the whole size 16 by a size 16 and a half, and so forth. That's the sizing that you need for working with a front width measurement to get, get great fitting finesse. Now for patterns. I have some examples of pattern styles. We're going to work with a very classic style, something basic without a lot of darts and fitting and pattern pieces, but something that you can wear, not a fitting shell. This dress or jacket is a perfect example of how to work with a classic style. This blouse pattern, too, has some maybe style options, but yet pretty basic and fitting so that you could get a classic fit. This next pattern shows a couple of options, a simple top, a long or short sleeve jacket, even pants, something, again, classic style. A vest is another great option. This vest has princess styling, which we'll be discussing through this series, has some fashion options, but yet you can check your fit with a basic style. And we have just two more to show you, just to reinforce that you're going to use a basic pattern like this blouse or the dress, and yet you'll have a great looking garment when you're finished, but not a lot of pattern pieces to put together. The concept of working with a classic style pattern is if you can get this classic style to fit, you can apply the same recipe of alterations that you used on this style to any other style. 
The alterations are simple. I hate to use the word alterations, but that's exactly what it is. They're changes in the pattern, and they require basic fitting tools. The fitting tools, beside your pattern, you'll need some paper, some pattern paper. Wax paper would work fine too, or tissue paper, pins. Every sewer needs pins, and so we'll be moving the pattern with the use of a pin, of course a tape measure, and then two colors of marking tools marking pens, I should say. Here I black and red. One will be tracing the outline of the pattern, and the second will show the change. So this is what we made, what we need for fitting tools for fitting finesse. The first fitting finesse change I'd like to give you today is working with the bust line. Obviously you'll start by measuring around the fullest part of the bust line, and this illustration shows how simple that is. Measure with a tape measure parallel to the floor, and Place a thumb or finger underneath the tape measure so that you are getting a very accurate measurement, not too tight and not too loose. If you would like, enlist the help of a sewing buddy to help you take this measurement. It will go a lot faster. Record that measurement or make a note of that measurement, whatever you happen, happen to be. Again, taking it to the closest half of an inch, not worrying about eighth of an inch and fourth of an inch widths. And then compare that measurement to the measurement given on the back of the pattern envelope. I highlighted on this pattern a size 14, and the size 14 bust line measurement happens to be 36 inches. So if you know that your bust measurement is 38, and the pattern is made for a 36 inch measurement, you'd have to add 2 inches to the pattern. Now, where does this measurement go? 2 inches is going to be divided by 4, because there are 2 seams, one on each side, but 2 layers of fabric two in the front, two in the back, so you divide it by four. In this instance, I'll be adding a half of an inch per each side seam, or each cut edge, and I'll show you how to do this. I mentioned earlier we'll be working with a worksheet, tissue paper, pattern paper, whatever type of paper you'd like, and two marking pens. Rather than cutting the pattern apart and slashing it, what I'm going to recommend to do is to outline the pattern, the cutting line, right on your worksheet using one color of pen. Just trace following the pattern cutting line. Then measure out the needed increase. In this instance, I'm working with a half of an inch. Measuring out from the underarm area and place a mark measured from the cut line that half of an inch. Now to make the changes, I'm going to use a pin. And I'll make, use a larger pin just so you can see it a little bit more clearly. The pin is placed at the shoulder, right where the stitching lines cross where the shoulder and armhole lines meet, and I'm going to pivot or move the pattern to meet that increase mark so that the cutting line and the new half inch increase are aligned together. Now trace the shape of the armhole, and I'm following the identical shape that the pattern has given me. And trace around the corner. Leave the pattern pivoted and move the pin to the underarm where the stitching lines cross. It's always at that underarm area or where the seams cross, and now pivot this. It swings like a pendulum on a grandfather clock. Pivot it so that it meets the original pattern at the waistline. We only change the bust line in this instance. I'll place the pattern back on the original tracing or outline. I would tape this to the pattern, and here would be my change. It's so smooth and simple, and best of all, let me show you this armhole. It's the same size so that the sleeve will fit in here without any change. And that will give you two inches if you add the same thing to the back as you did to the front. It will give you that two inches around the bust line. Now if you can increase, you can decrease. If your pattern measured 36 inches and you measured 34, it would be a little bit too large. So in this instance, to decrease, we would measure in from the cutting line a half of an inch, place a mark on the pattern, and go through the same process of placing the pin at the shoulder where the stitching lines cross and pivot the pattern to meet the decrease mark. Again, following the shape or outline of the pattern, you get a decrease. Then move the pin to the underarm, again, where that stitching line crosses, and then pivot to meet the waistline. This is just changing the bust line, not the waist. We'll, I'll show you some combinations of alterations as we go along, but it's best just to kind of take it one by one. Now, there you can see the change of making the width smaller and tapering it at the waistline. When cutting this pattern out, all that I'd like to do is to just fold back the pattern and tape the worksheet to my pattern and cut along the smaller line. 
That way you have the grain line, the other notches and darts marked for you. And this is a simple way to change the pattern by either decreasing or increasing. Once you know how simple it is to pivot the pattern to make changes to increase or decrease, you can easily change the waist and the hip line as well. First of all, start with the waistline. To measure your waist, bend to the side, and the deepest wrinkle is your waistline. That's kind of a quick way of finding the right placement. Then, with a tape measure, measure again around the smallest part of your figure, your waistline, placing a thumb or finger underneath the tape measure, as this illustration shows measuring to the closest half of an inch. Compare your measurement to the measurement given on the back of the pattern envelope. I'm going to use the example of having a measurement of 31 inches for the waistline. The pattern is made for 28. The difference between the two, obviously three inches. I like to use a simple fraction idea for making the changes or knowing how much to quickly add. Simply place the number of inches that you need to add or subtract over the number of cut edges. Now there are generally four cut edges two seams, but two layers of fabric per seam. So that's three-fourths of an inch is all that you need to add in this instance at the waistline. On the pattern, I've already outlined the basic pattern. I'm going to simply measure three-fourths of an inch and place a mark right on my worksheet. Rather than the pin being placed at the shoulder, we're simply going to move the pin in this instance to the underarm, right again where that stitching lines cross. This is very gradual, makes a lot of common sense to just pivot the pattern to meet the increase mark and follow the pattern outline to make this change. We'll simply make the change a little bit wider at the side. Repeat on the back piece and you would easily add three inches to the pattern just by adding three-fourths of an inch on the pattern pieces. If you can increase, you can decrease. Rather than measuring out from the cut edge, for decreasing, let's measure inward keeping the pin at the underarm where the stitching lines cross and pivot to meet the smaller change. Very gradual. Rather than guesstimating when you're cutting out your pattern how much to take off, this just gives you a nice line to follow. Pin back the pattern when you attach this tissue paper to your pattern so you get the right cutting line. Simple as that. Now the hip line. The basic three width measurements, what bust, waist, and hip, you need to measure that hip. Have your sewing buddy measure around your fullest part of your figure, wherever it may be. Again, with a tape measure parallel to the floor. Then here's a second illustration or measurement you need. With the free end of the tape measure, measure the distance between your waist and your hip line so that wherever your hip may be placed, you'll get that right measurement right on the pattern. Here I'm going to use an example of measurement of 42 inches. The pattern is made for a 38. Now, generally, you may be buying a pattern a little bit smaller than what you traditionally have used, so adding four inches really isn't a lot of m measurement to add. You'll soon see you'll add four inches to four cut edges, and some simple math tells you you'll be adding one inch on each side. I have marked in my pattern where this hip line should be placed. This is a kind of a short pattern, so I've made the hip line higher than perhaps it has been allowed on the pattern. Just to show you, wherever you have the fullest part is where I'd like you to make the measurement, so that this red line coincides with the distance between your waist and hip. Measure out one inch from your hip line placement, and then make that same one inch measurement way at the hem line, so that you have a nice tapered line going from hip to hem. Here I'm going to place a pin at the underarm, same place as the waistline, where the stitching lines cross. And for this sheath dress, I'll simply taper or pivot the pattern to meet the increase mark at the hip line. Then at the hip, so that the pattern doesn't flare out as it is right here, I'll put the, place the pin at the hip, angle this down. It's very logical, as you can soon see. And when I place this back to the original position, presto, there's my change. And again, repeat the same alteration on the back piece. Now, if you're wondering, oh, Nancy, I may need to add a little bit to the hip and maybe a little bit to the bust line. Yes, you can do it all in one worksheet. I'm showing it to you individually, first of all, but then you can combine them. Simple, very simple to do so. Let's add, oh, a half of an inch this instance. We'll use the same pattern at the bust line. And then that same one inch at the hip and also at the hem line. Well, rather than pivoting for the hip line, first of all, we'll start at the top. Start at the shoulder where the stitching lines cross and pivot to meet the bust line increase. 
Then trace that armhole just as I showed you earlier in this program. Go around the corner and then move the pin to the underarm and pivot to the hip line. And trace this increase all the way down. And then from the hip to the hem. And within a matter of minutes, you have changed this pattern to increase the bust line and hip line. Earlier in this series, I detailed working with pivot and slide techniques. So far, you've just seen the pivoting, changing the width for the bust, waist, and hip line. Now for the length, I'm going to slide the pattern up and down as if it were a window. And to change the length, the first length alteration of this series is to change the position of the dart. You may want the dart higher or lower, and first of all, check to see if the pattern is right for you. Pin the front and back pattern pieces together as if they were sewn, just at the shoulder seam. Place it on your figure. Then, as this illustration shows, align the center front with your center front, and mark wherever you have the fullest part of your figure. Mark it right on the pattern. Unpin the pattern, then we'll do some measuring. On this particular pattern, it was multiple size, so I have three darts here. I've highlighted the dart size I'm going to be working with, and then measure the distance between the dart and your figure. You always want the dart to end about one inch from the fullest part of your figure, which this does in this instance, and the, the depth or the length between the dart and the, your position is one inch, so it'll be a simple change. Just lower the dart by one inch. Traditionally, we may be asked to cut out a section of the pattern and drop it down. You're cutting your pattern apart, and I don't always like to do this. The simple way of working it, with it is on the worksheet to outline the hemline and the center front. The center front is going to be used as a guide to slide the pattern up and down to keep it on grain. The side seam of the pattern, is, or the side area, the cutting line, is not traced. To lower this dart by one inch, I'm simply going to measure down from the cut edge one inch and place a little mark just for my reference. Align it back up to the original tracing and then slide the pattern down following that center front until the cutting line meets that one inch mark. Trace the side seam and about a couple of inches below the dart. Now at the dart area itself, mark the dart legs, the lines that make up the dart, and if possible, use a tracing wheel and trace the dart legs so that the perforated lines will be marked on the wax paper or the worksheet. Then slide the pattern back up to the original position following that grain line again so everything's aligned. And notice now how the lower dart section has been added to your pattern and continue tracing. This is the time where you're going to be adding the worksheet on top of the pattern as opposed to underneath the pattern. And I can see the perforation, possibly you can't see it as well as I can, but I'll just simply highlight the dart legs following that perforated line, and there's my lower dart. Now you might guess that if you'd like to raise that dart, it's the reverse. And I'm simply just going to show you on this sheet, rather than sliding the, the pattern down, slide the pattern up the amount that you'd like to change it. Trace around that side seam change. Again, use the tracing wheel, to perforate where that dart should be for the raised position. And when you slide it back down, on the underside, I have a raised dart area rather than a lower dart. And that's how to slide the dart up or down. In this first program of fitting finesse, I detailed working with the basics of fitting, getting the right pattern size, and then some of the pivot and slide alterations. The pattern size, in my opinion, is probably the most crucial. Getting it to fit your shoulder area rather than buying it to fit a width measurement that can easily change. That front width measurement, again, is size measuring about the crease in one arm to the crease in the other. And I gave you those sizing measurements. Just as a quick reminder, all those sizing measurements are written in the company book, Fitting Finesse. When working with a pattern, choose a basic style, a classic style, as I like to say, something that doesn't have a lot of pattern pieces, has fitted details, but some straight lines, not a lot of pieces to put together. And use this kind of as your recipe, something that you're going to start off with. And once you find out what changes you need to make on this classic style, that's what you can make on all stylized patterns from there on out. So we're working with something very practical we can wear, but then we can apply these alterations later. Next, I'll give you some more detailed items on working with fitting finesse. Before we go on to the next project, I'd like to talk about one of the fine underwriters of Sewing with Nancy, 
I'm sure you've noticed that I use FOF sewing machines and surges exclusively in my television show and videotapes, and there's a good reason for it. FOF machines provide the reliable performance I need, and they're very easy to use. What's more, FOF stitch quality is exceptional. So whether I'm using a FOF creative model for elaborate fashion sewing or a high relaxed serger for home deck work, I know I can count on my FOF to help me do my best sewing every time, and so can you. Your local FOF dealer is there to help and can show you the entire FOF line. Hi, I'm Nancy Zeem, and welcome to Sewing with Nancy. Today I have the second program of our three-part series entitled Fitting Finesse, working with classic style patterns and doing some specialty alterations to make them custom fit your figure. Today in the second program I'm going to specialize in working with the shoulder and the back areas of patterns. I just have a classic style back pattern. I'm going to show you a length in the back, make it shorter, square, slope, narrow or broad the shoulder. It's all very simple and that's what's coming up next on Sewing with Nancy. Making the changes on the pattern is a very simple process. If you were with us during our first program in this series, I showed you how to pivot the pattern to make width changes, slide it to make length changes, and we're working on a worksheet, a piece of paper, tissue paper, pattern paper, wax paper, whatever you'd like to use, some pins, and marking pens. First of all, we're going to work today with the back, as I mentioned, and shoulder alterations, starting with the back length. The back length measurement is measured, as you can see, from the base of the neck to the waistline, a flat one-to-one -one ratio. This is the measurement that's given on the back of the pattern envelope. There are four of them, bust, waist, hip, and back length. So simply compare your measurement for the length to the pattern's measurement. Now perhaps you may have what's commonly called a sway back. There's too much length in the back. And you'll have on your clothes, or perhaps you've seen on someone else's clothes, where wrinkles gather like this at the back. There's too much length. Crosswise fold wrinkles in indicate too much length. To get rid of that length, after you compare your measurement to the measurement of the pattern envelope, we can take care of it just on the back piece. Obviously, that's just where the alterations are needed. I've already outlined the pattern, and let's say, for example, that you would like to decrease one length, one inch, excuse me, one inch from the length. So I'll measure down from the cutting line one inch. This is a combination of sliding the pattern and pivoting it. Sliding it down following the grain line will give us the pattern or keep it on grain. And now I'm going to outline or trace the cutting line at the neck. What's nice about this is that the collar facing or whatever shape is going to be applied here will fit perfectly because I followed the same shape as the pattern. Leave it in this position and then place a pin at the neckline where the stitching lines cross, the neck and the shoulder seam meet. The pivot point is always placed at where the cross mark is or ends. Then pivot like a pendulum on a grandfather clock the pattern to meet the original tracing at the end of the shoulder. And then outline the shoulder. Simple as that. And there's the alteration to make the sway back, to make it shorter. The collar or neckline will fit fine. The front and back shoulder seams will fit together because it's the same length, but yet the length from the back piece has been taken away. Now you can attach this to your pattern by just folding down the extra pattern and cutting around, in this instance, the red mark, or you could actually trim your pattern piece however you'd like to work it. You've now made that change. The opposite of taking away length is adding length. Maybe you have a curve back or you stand stooped. This is alteration is solved in the same manner. Here you can see the stress wrinkles that often occur in a figure where there are wrinkles, the length isn't long enough, I should say, at the back. Obviously not going to change at the front, just on the back piece. First step is always to kind of outline that basic pattern on the worksheet so you have a basis for, to work from. And I've worked on this already. And we're going to add, in this instance, 3 fourths of an inch. Let's say your measurement was 3 fourths of an inch longer than the pattern's measurement, or what was written on the pattern envelope. Now instead of sliding the pattern down, following that center back, I'll just slide it up to meet the longer length. Draw the longer center back and the neckline, following the cutting line. We always trace following the cutting line. The pivot point remains the same. I'll place the pin at the neckline where the stitching lines cross and pivot like a pendulum the pattern so that it meets the original tracing at the end of the shoulder. 
and trace the shoulder line. When I would meet this back to the original pattern, the collar or facing would fit at the neckline. And when you're adding a lot of length at the shoulder, you may find that the back shoulder seam is just a touch longer. Well, almost on every pattern, like it says on mine, it states to ease the back shoulder to meet the front. You possibly will have to ease a little bit more length, but it will give that extra length that you need in the pattern piece without slashing the pattern, and it will also keep it on grain. So those are two simple changes to make that back fit with finesse. The next four alterations that I'd like to show you have to do with changing the shape or length of the shoulder. First of all, narrow and then broad shoulders. Measuring the shoulder length isn't a measurement that I'd like to take on a figure because a shoulder seam really is a style feature. If you think style feature, well, I'd like to show you three patterns that are the same size. And even though they're all a size 8, these patterns have various degrees of length of the shoulder and also depth. So to measure the shoulder length is kind of a difficult measurement to take and then apply to the pattern. So when making narrow shoulders or broad shoulders, I like to use a fitting formula. First of all, I think you kind of know if your shoulder length is generally too long or too short. On a length that's too short, as you can see here, the shoulder seam, or your length is too short, your shoulder seam falls off the end of your shoulder. The fitting formula that I like to use is if you have very narrow shoulders, take off a half of an inch, slightly narrow, just a fourth of an inch. Generally, I go in fourth of an inch increments. Shoulder seams on an average are about five inches or so long, so taking off a half of an inch is 10% of the length, so that's why a fourth of an inch maybe just be the right amount for you. As with before, we're going to just trace the pattern shape on a worksheet. And first of all, for the narrow shoulders, measure from the cutting line a fourth or a half of an inch, and I've guesstimated about a half of an inch to remove length. The traditional thing to do would be just to cut off the shape of a fourth of an inch or a half of an inch, but that increases the shape of the armhole so that the sleeve doesn't fit in as well. So to make this work very effectively, we'll just align the pattern to the outline, slide it over following the traced line, place a pin at the shoulder where the stitching lines cross, where the shoulder and armhole seam meet, and then pivot the pattern so that the underarm and the original tracing are lined up. And now trace the new cutting line. There'll be a slight change at the underarm, just a very slight change, but it keeps that armhole the same shape. When I place the pattern off the tissue, you can see where the new cutting line is, and then often when cutting this off, I would just fold back the pattern and use the red line as my new line. The next step, obviously, is to repeat this process on the front piece. Whatever you do to the back, you must do to the front when changing the shoulders. The broad shoulders reverse. This illustration shows the common stress wrinkles that occur if the shoulder length is too long. Often, th this is common in menswear. Many of these alterations can be applied to menswear as well as to sewing for children or sewing for gals. To make the shoulder broader, we're going to use that same fitting formula process, a fourth of an inch or a half of an inch. I always add a little bit at a time. You can always maybe change it the next time around. So we'll just add a small half of an inch, add it at the length of the shoulder. The process is the same. What's so nice about this, if you can increase, you can decrease, or if you can add, add you can subtract. And here we're just going to slide it again following the original trace line. Draw the longer shoulder seam and around the corner. Here I'm going to place a pin again at the shoulder where the stitching lines cross, and I'll pivot the pattern to meet the same tracing that's at the underarm. And when I trace this, we'll just simply follow that underarm, and there's the broader shoulder. This time it extends out further just the way the body is shaped, and it goes a little deeper at the underarm but the sleeve will fit in perfectly, you will feel fine on your figure, and you'll get rid of those stress wrinkles. Again, tape the pattern and the worksheet together so that you can cut along the new line. And that's how to work with narrow and broad shoulders. Sloping and square shoulders are the next two shoulder alterations I'd like to detail. And again, we're going to use the fitting formula idea. There's really no way to measure whether you have how square your shoulders are or how sloping they are, but the wrinkles in clothes that you have probably indicate that. First of all, square shoulders. 
Here you can see the illustration that there are wrinkles that radiate out from the neckline. Many times the collar, or in this instance, the neckline rides up at the neckline, indicating the shoulders are just a little bit square at a fourth of an inch or a half of an inch, depending upon the squareness of your shoulders. On every pattern that I make, I always alter for square shoulders, and here's how. I'm working with the front piece, and the alteration would be the same for the front and back, and I've outlined the pattern as we've done in all the other previous alterations. For square shoulders, I measure up a half of an inch from the cutting line. Let me push this down so that you can see, measure up a half of an inch or a fourth of an inch. The pin is placed at the neckline, and I'm going to pivot the pattern to meet the increased mark. And obviously the shoulder seam has been placed higher, just the way that the arm and shoulder are structured higher. Now the pin goes at the underarm, excuse me, at the shoulder where the stitching lines cross, and will pivot to the underarm, so that the cutting line and the pattern align at the underarm, and trace the armhole. The same steps would be accomplished on the back piece. When I place this back to the original position, you'll be able to see that everything has been raised, just like a square shoulder. Repeat on the back piece, and then all the positions will line up. The sloping shoulder is next. And sloping shoulders many times have occur uncommon or uncomfortable wrinkles at the underarm. This illustration shows how some bias fold wrinkles form at the underarm. Many times when I give seminars and people say, how do you make an armhole deeper? Generally they need to make sloping shoulders because their shoulders angle down at a slighter, greater slope and it, this garment binds at the underarm. Here's how to solve that. Again, I've traced the pattern on the worksheet and instead of measuring up for square shoulders, we're just going to measure down. Measure down a fourth or a half of an inch. And place a pin this time at the neckline where the stitching lines cross and pivot to meet the angle. Trace the shoulder and then from the shoulder seam to the underarm. The armhole is in the same position but it's just been angled downward to fit the shape of the body. And then again repeat on the back piece. Simple changes, they make logical sense when you see them positioned on the worksheet. The last alteration for this segment of Sewing with Nancy will be the broad back. This instance, you'll many times have wrinkles that are stressed wrinkles across the back with as on this illustration. It's just too tight. When you're driving a car, giving somebody a hug, or reaching into the top cupboard, you just don't have enough room in your clothes in the back. And this is how you alter for this. The back area requires a special measurement. As you might guess, we're going to measure across the back comparable to the way we measured the front width earlier in this three-part series. This illustration shows that you measure above one crease in the back arm across the back width to the other crease. It's just the reverse of what we use for the pattern sizing. To this measurement we need a little ease. This measurement is not given on the back of the pattern envelope. Only the bust, waist, hip, and back length are given, so we have to kind of determine how much ease is in a pattern. All patterns have ease in areas for comfort, for style, and the basic ease that is needed for a back width is an inch and a half. Let's say, for example, my back width measurement was 16 and a half inches. I would place the end of my tape measure, adding an inch and a half to 18. I have the tape measure folded in half because I have a half of a pattern. And I'm simply going to place the tape measure down, placing the fold of the tape measure at the stitching line and measuring across the center of the back. This pattern measured two inches shorter than actually my measurement. You can understand or see that it only shows one inch on my tape measure, but this is half of a tape measure. I'm going to add one inch to both the center of the armhole and at the underarm, because when adding to the back, you need to add in those two places. We'll grab my marking pen again and tape measure and measure out one inch from the center of the armhole and the same amount at the underarm. This is one of those rare occasions that you add in two places. The pin is going to be placed at the shoulder where the stitching lines cross, where the seams meet, and pivot to meet the increase. This will give quite a great width across the back. This is adding a total of two inches width. Then place the pin at the center of the armhole 
and pivot to meet the increase at the underarm. And now I'll continue the shape of the armhole. From the underarm, I'll simply go back to the original waistline. When I put this back in the original position, you can see the broader back, a much wider pattern, but yet the sleeve will fit in there without any change, and that's how to make the back wider. In today's program, I've detailed many alterations for shoulder and back, and perhaps you may have more than one alteration needed on your pattern, and I'd like to show you how to combine them. First of all, the two-step method, then the one-step. Two-step mean you do the alterations one by one. I just finished showing you how to increase the back width for a broad back, and I have cut out the worksheet and attached a pattern, worksheet, to my pattern where I have the changes, and I added, this is a little narrower back width change, a half an inch both at the center of the back and at the underarm, and we've shaded the change area so that you could see more clearly. For example, if you'd like to make a broad shoulder on this pattern, then you would measure out a fourth or a half of an inch from the shoulder area, and then I've already traced the worksheet following my new change, following the red line that I had on my worksheet. And now I would simply slide the pattern, make the longer mark, place a pin at the shoulder where the stitching lines cross, and pivot back to re meet the outline on my original pattern. And I'll be tracing, it missed a section here, I'd be tracing following the new pattern. It gets a few more lines in here, but you can see the change that you'd be doing. And you'd tape the two pattern pieces together. The one-step method is a little faster. And once you get more accustomed to this and feel comfortable, you can certainly work with both at one time. I'll start at the top, the shoulder first, and work your way down the side. This pattern is noted for the same two changes, a broader back. Notice I have an increased mark at the shoulder, and then a wider back both at the center of the armhole and at the underarm. So to do this one-step method, I'll slide it over, draw the longer shoulder seam, then place the pin at the shoulder and pivot to meet the increase mark at the center of the armhole. At the center of the armhole, I'll place the pin and pivot to meet the increase mark at the underarm. Trace the rest of the armhole. And then from the underarm, I'll simply go back to the original waistline. So this was accomplished with one sheet of, of a worksheet. I have the same increase, but it's a little bit more streamlined. Let me show you this again, how to make combinations. For example, on this one, I'm going to make a sloping shoulder and also a little bit narrower of a shoulder. The pin would go at the neckline where the stitching lines cross starting at the very first pivot point, and I'll angle down to meet the slope mark. But now this shoulder is narrower, so I'd slide it over and draw the shoulder seam, which is shorter and also sloping. The pin is placed at the shoulder where the stitching lines cross, and I'll simply angle this back to the measurement or marking at the underarm. And at home, you can maybe trace a little bit straighter than I'm managing today, but here you can see that we have a narrow shoulder and a sloping shoulder, all in one worksheet, using the one-step method. In the second program of Fitting Finesse, I detailed working with, obviously, the pivot and slide techniques. I think you're getting the idea how simple these pattern changes can be and are to do. One additional hint, especially in the shoulder area, you may have on your figure one shoulder higher than the other. What I would recommend, for example, if you had one square shoulder and the other was not needing of this alteration, to cut out your pattern pieces, both front and back, with the square ch shoulder alteration. Then after cutting out your fabric for the higher side, remember you can always take away fabric, you can't add it back on, then remove the alteration. And here we'll just slip it down. Then cut out the opposite side that was not square, removing the extra fabric. Do the same on the back piece. I kind of like to do this after I've cut out the fabric. Remember, you can take away fabric, but you can't add it back on. In our next segment of Fitting Finesse, I'm going to work with stylized patterns. We'll be right back after this short pause. Here's a message from Ginger, a national underwriter of my program. Ginger Incorporated manufactures the finest shears and scissors used by sewing enthusiasts across the country. Ginger products are valued for their tradition of excellence and quality. 
I rely on Ginger's shears and scissors for all my cutting needs. Ginger is recognized by sewing experts as a premier line of cutting tools in home sewing and needle arts. Look for Ginger's scissors and shears at your favorite sewing center or in the latest Nancy's Notions catalog. I'm Nancy Zeman. Welcome to Sewing with Nancy. This is my third program of a three-part series entitled Fitting Finesse, using a basic pattern and fitting it with pivot and slide techniques. In the first two programs of this series, I detailed the pivot and slide techniques with, as I mentioned, classic styles. But now it's time to advance, to work with more stylized patterns that have multiple seams, as you can see in this princess-style dress and jacket, or working with special patterns, let's say with raglan or dolman style. And that's what's coming up next on Sewing with Nancy. Before I show you how to alter stylized patterns, I'd like to do one more alteration on classic styles. That's the sleeve. If you've ever had your sleeve draw or be too tight around your arm, chances are you need to increase the sleeve width. It's simple. First of all, measurement. This illustration shows to measure around the fullest part of your arm between the elbow and the shoulder. Again, measuring to the closest half of an inch. Unfortunately, on the back of the pattern envelope, it's not given as far as the arm measurements for the corresponding sizes. But you can simply check your measurement on the pattern after allowing ease. Ease is the extra room, the living room you need in patterns. You'll need two inches of ease added to your arm measurement. For example, if your arm measured 14 inches, you'd need a total of 16 inches for that sleeve to feel comfortable. And you'd measure un underneath the cap from stitching line to stitching line to see if this sleeve is the right size. Way over on this end, it measures 14 and a half inches. So this sleeve would be an inch and a half too tight if 16 inches was the measurement. To add an inch and a half, of three fourths of an inch will be added on each side. We're only going to divide the increase by two. There's one seam or two cut edges. So a simple way to do this is after tracing your pattern or outlining it on a worksheet, to measure out from the cutting line a total of three-fourths of an inch on either side. The pivoting in this instance starts at the large dot at the cap of the sleeve. Now place the pin in that area and pivot to meet the increase one side at a time. And then trace the new cutting line from cap to the underarm, just around the corner. Put it back in the original position, pivot to the other side so that the increase mark and the pattern are aligned. Again, trace the pattern, just one half of it. The sleeve will fit in here perfectly because this is the same cutting line. Then to get the remainder of the side seam, slide the pattern over along the hemline and draw the straight side seam. This is the way you accomplish the alteration for a short sleeve and repeat on the other side. And there's your altered sleeve. This is the cutting line, the red line, that would be attached to your pattern to give you the right change. Now, if you're working with a long sleeve, you do not need that increase to go all the way down. You simply need it to be added right at the underarm, wherever you have the widest part of your sleeve. So in this instance, I'll just kind of guess out about three-fourths of an inch on either side. I'd again place the pin at the large dot at the cap of the sleeve and pivot to meet the increase mark. Same first step as before. Outline that pattern and go around the corner. Then place the pin at the underarm where the seams cross, where the armhole seam and the side seam meet. Place the pin in that area and angle the pattern back to the original mark at the hemline, to the original tracing. And you simply follow the pattern, which gradually tapers this down to nothing at the hem. You repeat repeat the pro process on the other side, but if you just look on this area, you'll see what a nice gradual change that gives you in the armhole. This is really simple, but very valuable. The best thing to keep in mind is that the sleeve will fit perfectly because you not, have not changed the size of the armhole. Uh, like the jacket I'm wearing today has a two-piece sleeve. And you'll find on those pattern pieces, the patterns are a little bit differently shaped. Not to fear, this technique works just as well on a two-piece sleeve as it does on a one-piece sleeve. I'm going to stack the two pattern pieces together, the upper and under sleeve, as if they were sewn, meeting the stitching lines. And I've already marked a horizontal line starting at the underarm of the under sleeve.
sleeve and marking across the upper sleeve. We need to know where the increase mark should be on either side of the upper sleeve. And I'd like to show you how to do that now. I already have my pattern traced and I'll just work with only the upper sleeve. And you might get the idea that this is very simple and that is to pivot to meet the increase mark. Trace the pattern until the increase mark or the underarm area and at home you can trace a little straighter and then pivot from the underarm to the hem, gradually taper the, down to nothing. After repeating it on the other side, that's how that upper sleeve would be changed. Once you've mastered your fitting formula on a basic cl or classic style, you can apply those same techniques to more stylized patterns. For example, we're going to start with the raglan style. This is a rather casual look of a pattern that has raglan styling, but the seam of the sleeve angles from the neckline to the underarm at a bias. To get an increase at the bust line or change the sleeve requires a little bit different type of configuration. Again, following many of the same pivot ideas that I detailed earlier. If you have in the past increased your sleeve, let's say by the three-fourths of an inch that I just showed you in a basic sleeve, you could apply those same three-fourths of an inch amounts on a raglan sleeve. Now, whenever I see a raglan sleeve, I think of a bat wing. It just really has an unusual shape. This is one half of the sleeve. This is the center back, and this is where the increase would be in the underarm area. To measure out your increase, measure the increase from the cutting line and place a mark or hash on the paper. Now to do the pivoting, we don't have a shoulder seam. As you can see, we just have this long angle of the line. The pin is placed at the intersection of the seam for the neckline and the raglan seam. And this is just to increase the sleeve if you had to do that, just pivot the pattern so that the pattern cutting line meets the increase mark. What we're doing is getting more width in the sleeve or the underarm area. I have to be honest, sometimes on a raglan sleeve it's rather loosely fit, so you don't have to do this too often. But if the garment had a closer stylized fit, this is how you would accomplish it. Then the pin is placed at the underarm, it's really not the underarm, but the side seam, and we'll pivot the pattern back to meet the tracing at the sleeve. Now again, this is only what you would accomplish if you had to increase the sleeve on a basic style pattern. And here you can see that the width has been achieved through the, through the pattern, giving you extra fullness. The next step is to look at the bodice. Now, perhaps if you had to increase the bust line on a basic dress, then you may want to apply that same technique to the a raglan sleeve. Just because you increase the sleeve doesn't mean you have to increase the bust line or vice versa. It just happens to be the way I'm showing it to you today. This is pretty similar to what I just went over. But again, the increase mark would be measured out from the underarm area. These patterns look so comparable that it's obvious where the changes would go. At the stitching line, which is the neckline and the raglan sleeve, is where the pin is placed. And the pattern then again is angled to meet that increase mark. This will give you the width. Frankly, I've done more alterations on raglan to increase the bust line than the sleeve, but I just wanted to show you that once you know what you need to add, you can simply do that to almost any style using these simple ideas. And then angle this down to nothing at the waist area. And the back or front would look very comparable to the way the sleeve is altered. So that's the simple raglan style, very comfortable style to wear. You can add many inches in that area. And again, generally, you may have in a raglan style enough style ease in it that you don't have to do these. But this is just if it's a little closer fit. This style that we're showing on this card illustrates a dolman or perhaps a cap sleeve would be a version of this, where the bodice and sleeve are cut in one piece, one continuous piece. This can be a, tri a trick to fit if you don't know the right way to go about it. If you are altering it for square shoulders, as we did in our second program, or sloping or, or increasing the bust line, which I'll just show you today, you have to determine where to pivot. Let me show you the dolman sleeve. This is a back piece of a dolman, where, again, the bodice and sleeve are cut into one. Now, a drop shoulder, you may have the pattern will end about in this area, but regardless, you don't have a shoulder line to work with. So take a basic or your classic style pattern, and place it on top of the dolman. Now many times you'll find that this pattern has more ease or fullness in the areas, but align the center fronts or center backs in this instance 
and mark approximately where the stitching line would meet at the on the basic style, transfer that to the dolman pattern style. And I've just placed a mark where I'd put my, place my pivot pin on this particular pattern. If I was going to increase the bust line, I'd measure out from the underarm area the needed increase. I've already traced the pattern, place the pin at the dot, and pivot to meet the increase. Here I'm going to be tra tracing, I'll better trace straight, there we go, tracing around the whole sleeve shape, and then at the underarm, we place the pin and angle back to the waistline. And this is how to work with a dolman sleeve if you need to do the increase. The next stylized pattern I'd like to detail is working with the princess style. Princess styling is very common. It has two general types, and I'd like to start by showing you those pattern shapes. This is more of a traditional style of princess where there are many side seams. First of all, the seam comes in the middle of the figure, around the bust line to the shoulder. There are many pattern pieces, actually, four pattern pieces to make the front, with making it perfect for full scale or full size figures. You can add a lot of inches evenly. This next illustration shows an, another type of princess style where the seaming curves to the armhole. Both of these are considered princess styling. They have slightly different pivot points, and I'd like to detail that. As I mentioned, this is perfect for full-scale figures if you'd like to add many inches at, at the bust line and hip line. Of course, you can do the other alterations for the shoulder and broad back. I'm going to start with the bust and hip line just to give you the idea. I have the pattern pieces, the four pattern pieces. There's a back piece, a side back, side front, and the front piece. I have them all pinned together at the underarm as if they were sewn together, stitching line on top of stitching line. And let me just get them lined up as if the seams were sewn and they were actually fabric. So I had then could find where the underarm was placed. It's important to know where the underarm is on the pattern pieces so you know where to make the increase for the bust line is what I'm going to show you today. So I've simply marked that on all four pieces. Now before we show this to you on the pattern, I'd like to show you one more thing on these pattern pieces and that is look at all the seams. There are actually six seams. We have one, two, three, and then double it by cutting the pattern twice would give you six or twelve cut edges. If you needed to add a lot of inches, you would divide your increase by twelve. Just a small increase, you could do it just on the side seam, but let's say, for example, you needed to add six inches to the bust line. Could be a very common alteration. Divide it by twelve. We're also going to add to the hip line just that same amount, just to use it as an example. Starting off with the side panels, since these are all side seams, I can simply add to both pieces across from the increase, both on the, si the traditional side seam and then that angle seam that you see that I pointed out to you. Let's start with the side front. The pivot pin is the intersection point, and I'll simply pivot to meet the increase mark, trace the underarm, and then at the underarm, pivot out to meet the hip increase. And I've added just a slight increase at the hip. So you can see you can get a, adding a lot of inches very gradually in this manner. You would do the same on the front piece. Pivot at the intersection to meet the increase mark. And then from the increase mark to the hip line. Repeat the same on the side panel piece. Here's the change, very gradual change. On the underneath patterns, I've increased the front and back pieces already for you. You would not add to the center front or center back, just at the side areas. It's always important to add at the sides. That will keep the grain lines of the pattern straight without changing them. And let me line them up properly with the initial tracing line. Even though it's just a small little increase, because we have so many side seams, you can get that increase added very easily. So if you need to add a lot of inches, try working with the princess style pattern. The last part of fitting finesse and working with the patterns is what I call extra extensions. It's an area in pattern changing where you can add many inches, but you have to do kind of two steps. I save the most kind of challenging area in fitting to the last. Extra extensions are blocks of fabric or blocks of width added to the pattern after pivoting has been, ex has been accomplished. This example shows the red line, we've it pivoted, 
to increase the pattern, and here we've added an extension. And you may say, why do you want to do that? Well, in a bodice, for the bust line, the maximum you can increase by pivoting is four inches, or one inch on each side. If you simply do more than four inches, or add more than four inches, when you pivot the pattern and you sw start swinging it up, it obviously gets way out of proportion. The underarm gets way too high. The one inch mark, which is pretty common to have one inch or less, is the maximum. And then after that, just a little extension has to be added out. I have to admit that many years ago in altering patterns, I would just add a section right onto the pattern piece, especially in the underarm. The reason I recommend to pivot, first of all, is that if you just add extensions, and you can see I have just a blue highlighted extension added out on the pattern in this area, you don't have any room added in the underarm, and it's very difficult to raise your arm. It's constricting and the pattern will not feel comfortable. So you need that pivoting amount to get some width and a movement added in here, plus that little extra extension. On a sleeve, the most width that you need, or you can add, is one inch on each side. We've added that one inch, and believe me, that's a lot of inches, but still you may have to add a few more inches. You can see after one inch on each side, that sleeve would just go right up to the top, and that's obviously not where we need it. So we're going to add extensions to the bust line and sleeve. I want to make a point that this is where you, this alteration is added if you need to increase both the sleeve and the arm. First of all, you start off with the sleeve, and this chart gives us some guidelines. For example, if you needed to add four inches to the sleeve, you can add one inch on each side or two inches for the pivoting. Your extra extensions would be two inches or one inch on each side. As you might guess, that same one inch has to be added to the bust line. So the second part of this chart shows on the bust line that you needed to add, for example, five inches. Well, the bust increase would be added with the extra extensions of one inch on each side, or a total of four inches, remember there are two cut edges, and that that would only leave a minimum or a maximum of a fourth of an inch on each side for pivoting, a total of one inch. It's a little mathematical, just keep in mind you have to have the same extension on the sleeve as you do for the bust line. Let me just show you a little bit how to work with the extension. On the sleeve we've already added the increase by pivoting, and then simply slide the pattern out, the amount added for the extension, and draw this all the way down. It's just a section added out on each side. The same would be accomplished on the remaining side seam. So that same one inch has to be added on the bust line. And I'll just straighten that out. And you can see the great width added on the sleeve. But this blue section is what we're going to add onto the dress or bodice on both front and back. From that chart, remember this is the only time you have to do a lot of math for fitting, we pivoted one inch on each side, and then we'll need to add, a fourth of an inch, excuse me, total of one inch, we'll add that one inch for the extra extension. This way, the, fr the front and back, as well as sleeve, will all have the same length, and then we'll just pivot this down to the waistline. So the width added in this area and the width added in the sleeve will all come together and your sleeve and bodice will fit together. And that's how you work with the extra extensions. It's time to wrap up this three-part series on fitting finesse. I hope you're inspired to custom fit some of your patterns using pivot and slide techniques. It doesn't take a lot of know-how to work with this, just kind of some common sense of changing that pattern, pivoting it or sliding it wherever you need the fit. All the techniques used in this three-part series are in my book, Fitting Finesse. We det will detail working with tops and stylized patterns, skirts, as well as pants, and perhaps in a future Sewing with Nancy program we'll work with pants, but it's all the fitting information you need in one book. Well again, thanks for joining me. Happy sewing. Bye for now. This Sewing with Nancy video has been brought to you in part by Fof. You'll do your best sewing on a Fof. By Ginger, a tradition of quality in scissors and shears. And by Nancy's Notion Sewing Catalog, featuring specialty sewing books and notions.